What about the question of enthusiasm? How, after all the broadcasts, could you night after night still sound enthusiastic or excited? Well, I, from the very time I mounted the catwalk at the Forum in October 1952 until the day I retired, I always looked upon it as a tremendous privilege to have the opportunity to do something that I really loved to do. And I knew that around the country from Vancouver to Gander, Prince Edward, uh, Gander Newfoundland, there were any number of fellows who could do a hockey game just as well and in cases better than I. But the point is, I got the break. And I was enthusiastic about it. And one thing I said to myself, I am never be going to become complacent. And every time a player got a puck to me, it was a potential goal. And even in the days of expansion, when there would be some just horrible games with teams coming in with their objective to keep the score low against the Canadians and would start to shoot it down the ice even in the first period, and it was difficult to work up enthusiasm, I worked exceptionally hard to keep that momentum of interest and enthusiasm going. In other words, it was all in, a prep, in appreciation for the wonderful break I got. Did you ever have a moment where you walked away from the mic saying, that was not a good night? Oh, certainly, certainly. Uh, I, I think that the individual who does the broadcast is his own worst enemy and critic because uh, we begin to nitpick little things that perhaps the ordinary listener or viewer would never notice. They're still there in that subconscious for a while, and you think of them. But as you get older and more experienced, I think one is able to handle that without any detrimental effect. Let's talk about the great Foster Hewitt for a moment. You were a big fan of his, mm -hmm. and you said that he, quote, showed us how, all how to do it. Well, there's no question about it, and I, I think that anybody who has ever worked in the field of hockey broadcasting, owes him an invaluable debt of gratitude for what he has done. He blazed the trail, and we have been disciples of Hewitt, all of us, from his day right down to the present time. He showed us the way, maybe over the years in, in this particular age, it has become more sophisticated, no doubt it has, yet the elemental basics of this job of hockey broadcasting goes back with a big, big, big thank you to Foster Yud. The elementary is of play-by-play -play broadcasting. Yes, yes, yes. The terminology, others change it around, but in essence, when stripped of its accidentals, it remains that Hewitt approach. He was the one that coined the phrase, he shoots, he scores. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the man. And everybody has used it since, and why not? Is there any better way to build up a guy breaking in on the wing? And then as he gets close, you can see he's going to start to shoot. And when he shoots, and it goes in the net, he scores. It, it's wonderful. He shoots, he scores. Your first broadcast for the NHL was a Detroit-Montreal game were you nervous at all, the very first call-up? Well, I, naturally, I was nervous. Uh, in the middle of the week, I was working at CJCH in Halifax, and Finley McDonald, who is now a senator, was my boss, and he said to me, he said, in early in the afternoon, he said, Montreal called, they wanted to know if you'd go up and stand by in case Doug Smith does not recuperate from his illness and is not available on Saturday night. I continued on. I didn't believe him. And finally, about 4 o'clock, I got a call from Walter Downs, who was the producer in uh, Montreal. He said, Doug Smith is hospitalized with what is suspected as a heart attack. And I had done a junior game from the Forum in Montreal, Halifax, St. Mary's, and Inkerman Rockets in the Memorial Cup the year before. And everybody who did a game from the Forum was not taped. They had no tapes in those days, but it was put on a disc, and they had me on file, and that's why they thought of me. And I said to Mr. Downs, I said, look, I have never seen a National Hockey League game. How am I going to know these players? Well, he said, look, tomorrow night the Canadians play. It's not broadcast. Come up and watch it. 
Then Saturday, Detroit comes in about 7.30 Saturday morning. There was no pregame skates in those days. So I seated myself in the lobby of the hotel, watched them as they came out of the elevator. I went up to the broadcast booth. We didn't come on until 9 o'clock then. It was radio only. And I had from 8.30 to 9 to increase my familiarity, as I thought, with these players. When I get up there and they skate out in the ice, it was a disaster. From that 60 or 70 feet perch, the fellows whom I saw in the lobby of the hotel didn't look the same. I recognized, well, both three of Detroit. Kelly with his red hair. Leswick didn't have any hair. And Gordy Howe. So I didn't panic. I said, there's a job for me waiting in Halifax. And the fact I didn't panic, as soon as the news ended at 9 on, I came. And it went well until the third period. Detroit was pressing. And out of that pack came this guy carrying the puck down on the wing. I called him Busher Curry right through, and he went in and score, built it up, Busher Curry, and the crowd roared. And I waited. And while I was waiting, they gave me a spotter. Marvelous gentleman, sports writer Elmer Ferguson. He had never seen a game from that area. He was in the back of the end of the ring. And he said to me, he said, I think that was Butch Bouchard. <laughs> and it just dawned on me, Bouchard does have cur wavy hair like curry. <laughs> and I said, I pulled it. And I suffered it out because the first announcement was in French and I didn't know what they were saying. <laughs> Finally, they said in English, go by curry. And I was beside myself and Fergie said, you know, they all look the same from here.